Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon and welcome to the 1992-93 George Huntington Williams Memorial Lecture. George Huntington Williams was professor of inorganic geology and the first professor of photography at Johns Hopkins. In the 1880s, he founded the university's Department of Geology, known today as the Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences. This series was established in his memory in 1917. One of Professor Williams' contemporaries described him as probably the most gifted crystallographer in the annals of American geology. And I'm very pleased to note that several members of the Williams family are with us this afternoon. The Williams Lecture may be on any topic of widespread contemporary interest. And surely there is no topic of greater or more widespread contemporary interest than that that will be offered this afternoon. Previous Williams lecturers have included Julian Huxley, Dean Rusk, Uthant, Boris Yeltsin, and of course, most recently and very memorably just last year, Barbara Jordan. And now, it is not only a great pleasure, but really a high honor for me to introduce to you this year's Williams lecture. Archbishop Desmond Tutu is known around the world for his courageous and outspoken pursuit of racial justice in South Africa. In 1984, he was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for his leadership of what the Nobel Committee called the Nonviolent Struggle for Liberation. As the first black Secretary General of the South African Council of Churches from 1978 to 1985, Bishop Tutu used the international forum provided by that post to advocate the end of apartheid. His strong criticisms of the South African government and his calls for economic sanctions against South Africa were bitterly resented by the government and led to the confiscation of his passport. His voice, nevertheless, continued to ring around the world. And he continues to work today for racial conciliation and an end to violence in South Africa. Bishop Tutu was born in 1931. His father was a school teacher, and the future bishop also worked for several years as a school teacher after gradua graduation from Pretoria Bantu Normal College and the University of South Africa. In 1958, he began his ordination training at St. Peter's Theological College in Johannesburg. Following ordination as a priest, he continued his theological training at the University of London, where he received a master's degree in 1966. Bishop Tutu's steady rise, both in the leadership of the Anglican Church and in public recognition and influence, attest to his truly extraordinary qualities. In 1975, after the years he had spent teaching theology and serving as associate director of the Theological Education Fund of the World Council of Churches, he was named Dean of Johannesburg. In 1976, he was named Bishop of Lesotho. In 1978, as I have said, General Secretary of South African Council of Churches. In 1985, Bishop of Johannesburg. And in 1986, Archbishop of Cape Town. In 1987, he was also named President of the All Africa Council of Churches and in 1988, Chancellor of the University of the Western Cape, positions which he continues to hold. <clears throat> Bishop Tutu has always stressed the central importance of his religious calling, once describing himself as a simple pastor passionately concerned for justice, peace, and reconciliation. In a magazine interview conducted the day after the recent memorial service for the 42 who were massacred, he declared nonetheless, I am always hopeful. A Christian is a prisoner of hope. Ladies and gentlemen, join me in a warm welcome for Archbishop Tutu. President, ladies and gentlemen, friends, thank you very much for your very warm welcome 
and the very great privilege you have accorded me in inviting me to be one of the lecturers in this distinguished series. I bring you greetings from your sisters and brothers in Southern Africa. I don't say South Africa, the church to which I belong and of which I am Archbishop has dioceses in Mozambique, in Lesotho, in Swaziland, in Namibia, uh, and even on St. Helena, and uh, of course in the Republic of South Africa. And so to come and say I bring you greetings from all of those in these areas is to say we want to express to you a very deep thank you for your support of our struggle. Today, Mozambique may be being, seeing a peace that it has longed for for so many, many, many years. Namibia is an independent country today because of the support that people like yourselves have given us. And so I bring you those greetings. And I greet you too uh, in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Good afternoon. Well, that is uh, a somewhat lousy response, isn't it? Yes. I mean, I, I would, uh, maybe we should try again. Good afternoon. Slightly better. Sli slightly better. Thank you very much. Uh, we, we don't always get such a rousing welcome um, at home. Things are changing, of course. Um, but uh, the, the city of Cape Town is very well noted for graffiti. And on one occasion, they had uh, graffiti that read, um, God loves Alan Busak and uh, Tutu, which is very nice. And then somebody added, the gods must be mad. Uh, <laughs> friends, quite extraordinary changes have happened in the world in the last few years. We might just be guilty of becoming blasé and taking them somewhat for granted. I don't know whether you remember the cartoon, I think it was in Newsweek, it showed um, a, a Russian astronaut, uh, one of those who had been orbiting the Earth for a few months, uh, returning home. And as he was due to land, he, he said, well, I'm much looking forward um, to being welcomed by Comrade President Gorbachev. And he was told, well, Mikhail Gorbachev is no more uh, president. Then he said, oh, I'm so happy I'm returning home to the Soviet Union. And he was told, well, the Soviet Union is no more. Then he said, well, I'm looking forward to drinking some vodka. And he was told, well, it will cost you a zillion rubles. <laughs> <coughs> Poor guy. At home, uh, they tell the story uh, of uh, one of the uh, tramps coming to the door of uh, actually one of my colleagues and knocking on the door and saying, uh, and as he stood there, uh, she decided she would give him a blanket because it was winter. And he turned to her and said, no, man, these are new times and this is the new South Africa. A blanket? Where is the duvet? <laughs> it is quite staggering to think of what has happened in South Africa in just a short three years. In 1989, <clears throat> to protest against the iniquity of apartheid, the churches 
engaged in what was then called the Standing for the Truth campaign, which coincided with the defiance campaign of what political organizations were still not proscribed. We decided to contravene apartheid laws, which we said did not oblige obedience because they were immoral and unjust in much the same sort of way that the civil rights movement in this country breached Jim Crow laws. We decided to break the beach apartheid laws in a place near Cape Town. When we went to our designated venue, we had to run the gauntlet of several roadblocks manned by police armed to the teeth with shotguns, dogs, tear gas, and quirts, the bull whips that they used to such good effect and which you often saw images of on your television screens. And signs had been put up to announce that the beaches were out of bounds for humans because, quite surprisingly, the police were using them to exercise their dogs. It may have been a Freudian slip. Dogs could walk on God's beaches, but we, because we were black, could not. Because the laws decreed that we might not do so. Alan Busak and I, on that occasion, took a stroll on this holy ground to make our point, to claim God's beaches for God's people. And can you imagine? We were the indigenous people to whom that land had belonged in the first place. And we had, out of our generosity and hospitality, welcomed those who were then foreigners from across the seas. And now these people had expropriated our heritage and had now made us aliens in our homeland. It's a story that you will have heard, I mean, about how when missionaries came uh, to Africa because we had the land, they had the Bible, and they said, uh, let us pray, and we dutifully shut our eyes. And when we opened our eyes, lo and behold, they had the land and we had the Bible. <laughs> of course, they placed in our hands in this exchange that seemed so unequal, something that was so utterly precious because, as most of you must know, the Bible is one of the most subversive, the most revolutionary thing you can have in a situation of injustice and oppression. The police officer in charge of police operations on that day when we were demonstrating against apartheid laws ordered us to disperse and warned that they would be ready to use even live ammunition to ensure that the crowds did disperse. Now I never. They were ready to use even live ammunition ready to kill in order to stop us from walking on God's beaches whilst it was okay for dogs to exercise on those sacrosanct pieces of land. You wouldn't, you wouldn't have thought that people could be quite so dumb, would you? 
they tell the story of how the South Africans uh, got a little upset that um, at the time the Soviet Union, when it still existed in the United States, uh, were getting all the kudos for their space programs. And so there is this character called Van der Merwe, uh, who is not endowed with a great deal of uh, intelligence and uh, he announces that South Africa is going to uh, launch a spacecraft to the sun, no less. <laughs> and, and when they say to him, but I mean, Van der Merwe, you know, long before it gets anywhere near the sun, um, it will have been burned to cinders. And he says, you don't think we are stupid, we South Africans. We are going to launch it at night. Um, <laughs> Well, here they were prepared to kill in order to defend the laws of apartheid, to defend the immorally indefensible. That is the backdrop. That is, as it were, the before picture. That is where we come from. Because that is the kind of thing that was happening just a few, three years ago. And then the South African government called the racist election of 1989 September. And the disenfranchised and those who wanted a democratic non-racial dispensation opposed that election and demonstrated against it peacefully. In Cape Town, at about that time, about 20 people were killed. And we said in the churches, that Cape Town should protest the death of these innocent, peaceful protesters. And so we marched in September 1989. More than 30,000 of us marched in a mammoth, peaceful, and disciplined demonstration for justice, reconciliation, and peace. We marched in Cape Town first, and then they marched in the rest of South Africa. We marched in Cape Town first, and they marched thereafter in Europe, and the Berlin Wall fell. Freedom began breaking out all over the place, even in the most unlikely spots. Dictators who had thought themselves firmly in the saddle began biting the dust, biting it, comprehensively. Some were designated themselves life presidents, discovered that they suffered from a universal failing. They suffered from mortality. And their former docile subjects had an awkward propensity to hanker after freedom, making things a little uncomfortable for repressive authoritarian rulers. Why did freedom break out so exhilaratingly, even in South Africa, which had looked uh, for so long a, a hopeless case? Why did freedom come? I want to suggest a few reasons why it did. Mr. Gorbachev, who has fallen on somewhat uh, unhappy days, was a crucial factor Glasnost and Perestroika were important ingredients. They were catalysts setting in motion the thaw, which was to see the end of the Cold War, which ended in the collapse of communism. For a very long time, South African governments used to be able to invoke the ogre of communism, they, they used to be able to use the scapegoat of Soviet expansionism in what they called the total onslaught. And they depicted South Africa as the last bastion of Western Christian civilization. 
and under Mr. P. W. Porter, the predecessor of Mr. De Klerk, they adopted what they called the policy of total, the total strategy, where no holds were barred against all who were identified as enemies of the state, really those who were opponents of, of apartheid. And the kind of activity the South African government and its agents engaged in ranged from sort of ordinary, innocuous, dirty tricks through vilification and harassment, even including assassinations performed by death squads. And this is being revealed regularly, even by government-appointed judicial commissions in South Africa. Had a Mr. Brezhnev been in charge in the Kremlin, it is unlikely that we would have seen the unloosening of the tight communist system. It is unlikely that what then followed in the train of Glasnost and Perestroika would have taken place. And it is important, friends, for us to acknowledge the importance of the individual person. An individual person can make a difference. You can make a difference. Your contribution is in fact an indispensable ingredient in the whole process of freedom. And it is not correct for any one of us to be saying, no, what can puny I do? I've always said to people, remember, the sea is made up of drops of water. It is when a number of individuals decide that something is sufficiently important for them to form a coalition that, in fact, change does take place. And so we acknowledge the role that was played and played so effectively by Mr. Gorbachev. But it is equally true that had we had somebody other than a Mr. de Klerk, it is unlikely that the kind of initiatives he announced on February 1990 would have happened. It is still something like a dream. I said watching him make his speech in Parliament on the 2nd of February 1990, and I sat there pinching myself. I said, now, you know, this is the kind of thing I would like to hear from a South African state president. And clearly, this is a wonderful dream I am dreaming. <laughs> and, and someone is soon going to shake me awake, and I will awake to the ghastly, the horrendous realities of the apartheid dispensation. No, but we were not dreaming. Here was this man actually speaking about his willingness to release political prisoners, including Nelson Mandela. Here was a man speaking about their willingness and their readiness to unban black political organizations. Something that is almost certainly would not have taken place under his predecessor, Mr. Porter. And so one must acknowledge whatever one's political alignment, one must acknowledge the crucial role, the critical role that Mr. de Klerk played in setting in motion the kind of initiatives and the movement for democracy that is taking place in our country. And I would want uh, to salute him for uh, his courage, 
I do not always agree, have often disagreed very vehemently with the kinds of things that this government has done. But it is, it is, it is to be churlish not to acknowledge that he did do something that in a sense was an unthinkable for many who form his constituency. And now the prospect of a new dispensation is realizable. And we think that even now, despite the upheavals of the violence, the political grandstanding of many of the political leaders, that we will get there, that South Africa will be free, that all of us in that great country, which has almost everything, that that new the new South Africa will come to birth. You know, they 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 say that uh, at one time a South African was having a conversation with a Zambian. And um, in the course of the, this discussion, the Zambian said, well, you know, our Minister of Naval Affairs. And the South African said, what? Minister of Naval Affairs? I mean, how can you have a Minister of Naval Affairs when you are completely landlocked? <laughs> and the Zambian said, well, don't you have a Minister of Justice? Uh, <laughs> We, we have an incredible country, we really do, with some quite, quite remarkable people. And we do have the possibilities of becoming a paradigm for the world. Now, one is not saying that in any arrogant kind of way. It is just that South Africa does, in fact, have most of the world's problems, either writ large or writ small. I mean, you have the disparities between what you might call the first world and the third world. You have all the tensions and problems of race. And if, no, 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 when, when we get it right, as we must, then the world will say, ah, in fact, it is possible for people as diverse as those who live in South Africa to cohere as a community, to learn that our differences do not make as we so often tend to develop them into, things that separate. That our differences were given to us by God so that we would know our need of one another. That we are, in fact, made for togetherness. We are made for living in a delicate work, a network of interdependence. It's actually quite exciting. You know, when you think of what the scriptures say about us human beings, and that is why I was saying to you that the Bible is, in, in fact, an incredible instrument in the hands of those who may want uh, to throw off the shackles of uh, oppression. Because one, I mean, one of the things that the, the scriptures say about each one of us is you are created in the image of God. Now, that is dynamite. When you say someone is created in the image of God, you are saying that person stands for God. And that that person is made for freedom. And that is why you are able to say in moments when repression is at its most intense, you say to the perpetrators of injustice, hey, you have lost. You have already lost because you are really trying to take on God. When you perpetrate injustice, you are going against God. 
and you have had it. And we are really being nice to you, we who are in the struggle for goodness and justice. We, we, we invite you, join, join the winning side. The, the scriptures speak so wonderfully about us that we are different precisely in order for us to know just how much we need one another. That we are made for complementarity, for interdependence, for belonging together. That we are really, as we've sometimes said to our people when after that mammoth uh, uh, demonstration that I was speaking about of the 30,000, I said to, to this huge crowd, why don't you wave your hands in the air? And they did that. And there was a wonderful waving. And I said, just look at, just look at, just look at your hands. As, as they did this, they looked and we said, you are the rainbow people of God. You're black, you're white, all the colors, wonderfully, wonderfully. And that is why you are a rainbow. I mean, if you're one color, you would not be a rainbow. <laughs> you are a rainbow precisely because you are different. And, and, and isn't it marvelous that when you have a garden, it would be beautiful if it is a garden of roses, yes. But if it is a garden of roses, of daffodils, of carnations, I mustn't mention too many because I don't actually know too many kinds of flowers. But I mean, <laughs> isn't it, I mean, when, when you are hit by this splash of color, diversity is something that we should celebrate to say, I am a Jew and I am proud to be a Jew. I am black and I am proud to be black. In any case, there's not very much you can do about it. I mean... <clears throat> and we say we do need the contributions that come from... I mean, God... I don't mean that I have a hotline to heaven, but I know God did not make a mistake in creating you, you. It was not a divine mistake. And according to the scriptures, you are not an afterthought. See, I mean, God says some wonderful things. God says to Jeremiah, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Now, that, won't, that wouldn't get him very good marks at medical school, would it? I mean, <laughs> I mean, how do you know someone before they have been even conceived? But the incredible assertion that is being made is that you are not an afterthought, that God has planned you, and we don't believe this, that God has planned you from all eternity. You and you and you and you and you and you. That you are not an accident. I've sometimes said, I mean, some of us might look like accidents, but I mean, <laughs> <laughs> nobody, nobody is an accident. Isn't it, isn't it incredible? I mean, just, just, if, if we could but savor the meaning of this, that I am because God created me. And God created me because God loves me. And I matter. I am the result of love. The affirmation that that gives to each one of us. That we don't have to do anything to try to claim value. We already have that value. And it comes as a free gift. We don't have to do anything. We just have to be born. And we're there. 
and our value is an infinite value. And there is nothing anyone can do ultimately to reduce or erode that value. Okay. So we say, Mr. Gorbachev, Mr. de Klerk, uh, and we would say it would have been totally unthinkable that the, the process of freedom uh, would have been begun at home without a Nelson Mandela. And this is not to engage in a personality cult. You see, if, as Mr. de Klerk did do, when he went to, to the prison, he had met a man consumed by bitterness and anger, wanting to revenge. It is unlikely that Mr. de Klerk would have taken the risk of releasing him. And what he encountered, as we have encountered, is this incredible man, so filled with magnanimity, with a dignity. And it is not he alone. I mean, you meet a Walter Sisulu and many others. It is incredible their capacity to laugh. I met them soon after they came out of jail. 27 years in jail. And what is your crime? Your crime is to have the audacity to say, hey, I am a human being. No, that's all. They were saying, I am a human being with inalienable rights. Inalienable, inalienable means I don't ask for them from other, another human being. They are rights that are God-given. I don't go, no one goes to another human being and says, give me my freedom. My freedom comes from God. And, and so it was important for the processes at home that there was a Nelson Mandela with whom Mr. de Klerk um, could engage. We said when we spoke about Mr. Gorbachev that individuals make a difference. De Klerk made a difference. Nelson Mandela made a difference. You can make a difference. You can make a difference. You have made a difference. We went around asking, please, can you help us in the struggle, help uh, impose sanctions on the South African government? And for a long time in this country, the administration was totally set against sanctions. And we had this incredible thing. You went on to campus after campus after campus, and there was this remarkable thing of young students. Now, they were not the only ones, but it was the students, particularly, right around the country, demonstrating, protesting, boycotting. And boycotting on behalf of people what, more than 10,000 miles away. You could have said about the Vietnam War that some of them might have been doing these things uh, because their brothers might have been involved in, in the draft or that they were uh, involved also out of self-interest. But I mean, why, why worry about people over there? It was an incredible demonstration that despite everything that everybody has said about people being selfish, inward-looking, introspective, worrying about number one, that this is not true. That those students, in a remarkable way, were actually able to change the moral climate in this country. So that it was not just possible uh, for, for, your, for your Congress to pass 
uh, legislation, uh, sanctions legislation, but that they were able to master even a presidential veto override. And I think, I mean, that we want to give a very warm hand to young people, to students here, everywhere, students in the recent past and students now, uh, because you are saying, and you are saying to the world, you know that there are, there are things that are more important than exam grades. You know, I mean, I, I, sorry. <laughs> now, in a very real sense, you are saying there are things that are far more important than those. And you are saying this world can, in fact, be a better place. You're saying that, isn't, isn't that exciting? Now, you did make a difference. You did make a difference. And I want to give you a real humdinger of, a, of, a, of an applause. I mean, I can't do it all by myself, but will you join me in giving you... <laughs> I was, I was saying to people on one other occasion that I have to be careful how I do these things. On one occasion, we were in, in uh, Australia, and we, there were about 2,000 students, uh, young people. And I said, you know, the trouble is we don't celebrate who we are. Let's give ourselves a warm cheer. And they did that. Uh, and then I said, how about giving God a, a, a standing ovation? And they gave God a it, really, it nearly took the roof off. And without thinking, at the end of that ovation, I said, thank you. Um, <laughs> but I, 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 I mean, I don't now want to argue, I mean, anybody who says, well, did sanctions work? Did they hurt the people you wanted to? I say, you can engage in that luxury if you want. I know they worked. They... <laughs> that Namibia is independent today because of sanctions. So uh, there we are. The other reason is after decades of repression. The South African government thought they had knocked the stuffing out of our people. And they were amazed that even in 1989, our people could engage as they did in those protest actions. It seems to me there is an incredible quality in human beings. You don't have to teach human beings really accurately about freedom. You don't have to tell them that uh, repression is wrong, is unnatural. People know instinctively we are made freely for freedom and their spirits soar towards freedom as a plant turns towards light. in the kind of tropisms that uh, you learn about. I don't know a great deal about that, but I mean, uh, it's a nice little example. Um, <laughs> you, don't, you don't have to teach people about, about freedom. You don't have to tell them that it is unnatural to be repressed. And so our people stood up, and the government of South Africa knew that they were going to have to use unbearable levels of repression, unacceptable to the world, to put us down. And that is why you are able to say, no matter what happens, no matter how many guns may be used, no matter how many prisons may be filled, no matter how many people may be killed, it is an inexorable truth 
that freedom will prevail in the end. Injustice and oppression and lies cannot have the last word. And they know it. The perpetrators of injustice know it. They know it uh, in the pit of their tummy as they try to carry out their injustices. And we have to tell them, injustice, repression, hey, they are more expensive than freedom. Freedom is cheaper than repression. You don't have to spend so much money on, on all kinds of efforts to maintain yourself. And then, I think the last, the last reason why freedom, why freedom now? I myself believe that the witness of people down the ages for freedom, for truth, for justice, that these are not things that when they happen, evaporate into the ether forever and are destroyed and are lost. People killed and tortured in prisons for justice. We may not hear those cries, but they're not for nothing. Those who are killed for truth, those deaths are not for nothing. All of this penetrates into the atmosphere because this is a moral universe. Right and wrong do matter. Truth will out. It's, 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 it's wonderfully exhilarating. You know it. You know it. You know it does happen. I mean, if you have gone into a room where two people were quarreling, you didn't hear them, you didn't see them. And if they heard you come in uh, and they were suddenly smiling with one another. Almost all of us have got antennae sufficiently sensitive to say, ah, ah. <laughs> something wrong happened here. <laughs> there, is something, there is something in the atmosphere. Equally, you don't have to be told this is a happy home. The walls exude the happiness. You know it. You know it when you walk into a happy home. There is something, the vibes tell you, this is a happy home. And so, all of this has come to a head in our day. So that freedom breaks out all over. So that a student can stand in front of a tank. Who will ever forget that image? stands in front of a tank, and whilst we are all holding our breath, thinking that the tank is going to run him over, it, it swerves away from him. And he goes and he stands in front of it again, and he turns it away. Okay, yes, they were massacred. But China won't ever be the same. And those deaths are not for nothing. And so, friends, we are going to be free. In South Africa, all of us, black and white, it's going to be a glorious country. And we're going to say, hey, 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 why were we so stupid for so long? Thank you.